My partner, Micah, snapped his fingers in front of his face, but he didn't react, continuing to stare into the void. Take it away, I commanded the medics, and then turned to my partner. Let's go for a drive. I showed him the passport, taken from the man's jacket pocket, opened on the registration page. It's nearby, let's check what's there. Micah nodded and followed me to the car. Images taken from freepic.com, pixabay.com, canva.com. The man was discovered by a patrolman. He was sitting on the snow-covered sidewalk barefoot, wearing only pants, a t-shirt, and a light jacket swaying from side to side. His clothes were covered in blood. He mumbled something inaudible, and when the patrolman tried to pick him up, he shouted and started waving his arms. Then the patrolman called a squad and an ambulance. And Maja and I were lucky enough to be on duty that night. What do you think? I asked my partner, pulling into the right street. It's amazing how among Moscow's high-rise buildings, there was a private sector with unassuming houses. Household stuff, he said confidently. Now we'll find a wife, if only alive. I thought so too. There was not a scratch on citizen Petrov Ilya Anatolievich, born in 1975. The blood belonged to someone else, and Petrov was in a completely insane state. He didn't answer any questions, only mood, and asked what we wanted from him. The house stood out among the others. In the gray winter darkness, the gnarled fence glared blackly among the white snow. The trees in the garden were bare, despite the snowfall the day before. A chill ran through me as I pushed open the gate, and it creaked open. Micah, too, was quiet and gloomy, staring at the house. Shine a light, I asked when we reached the cleared path to the house. Micah turned on the flashlight, and we saw pools of blood on the porch and door. I put on gloves and gently pulled the door open. It slid open easily, swinging open wide, as if someone was inviting us in. I swallowed. There was a strange silence, like we were in another dimension, where the background sounds were absent. Micah shone a light into the house, picking out with the flashlight being the bloody footprints that led through a long empty hallway to a room. We stepped inside, and I fumbled for the light switch and turned on the light. The lamp flickered dimly, illuminating the modern decor for a split second, and then went out. I don't like it here, Micah grumbled. I didn't say anything, though I shared his feelings. Continuing to light the way with the flashlight, we walked into the room. The pungent copper smell of blood hit my nose, joined by the sickening musty odor of an old, uninhabited building. Clamping my hand over my nose, I flicked the light switch again, fumbling for it on the wall. The light blinded us, and for a moment we squinted. Fuck, Michael swore. The sight was not for the faint of heart. Even I, who had seen crime scenes many times, felt uneasy. The poor woman was unrecognizable. The walls, furniture, and even the ceiling were gloomy red. I pulled out my cell phone and called the forensics team. It looked like our Petrov had lost his mind and killed his, in all likelihood, wife. When I finished talking, Micah showed me a clean axe-shaped piece of the floor next to the body. Do you think he axed her? I asked. No, my partner answered. The axe was lying here, and then he took it away for some reason. There are no traces of blood on the floor, and if he had killed with that axe, there would have been drops. That's what I was thinking. The man didn't have a weapon on him, so he must have dumped it somewhere. While we were waiting for the brigade, we looked around the house and garden, but found nothing suspicious. The pictures on the dresser showed Petrov with a woman, presumably the murdered one. Images taken from freepic.com, pixabay.com, canva.com. A beautiful happy couple. I was glad there were no children. I hate it when children suffer. The woman was insanely sorry. No one deserves such a horrible death. No sooner had the crew arrived than we were called to another accident where we spent the rest of the night. I didn't get home until 10 in the morning and went straight to bed. Even in my dreams, I was haunted by the bloody walls of that house, hearing voices and laughter, and then a murdered woman appeared. She stretched her hands toward me, one of which had turned into an axe, 
and laughed madly so that her teeth stood out white against the bloody mess of her face. She shouted, kill, kill. I was pulled out of my nightmare by a phone call. Listen, Leok, here's the thing. Michael's voice sounded wary. Can you come over? What happened? Not yet awake, I asked. You'd better come over. Intrigued, I quickly packed and drove to the prosecutor's office, where I was called by Michael, trying to get the image from the dream out of my head. In the duty room, he showed me a table with photos. I immediately recognized yesterday's house and the victim's body. For a moment, it seemed that the photo smelled of the same mustiness that I had felt in that room. Look, Micah slid one photo to me. I took the card in my hands and marveled. In the same place where we had seen the silhouette of the axe, there was an axe of the same shape in the photo. The blade was almost shining. It was unclear whether it was the effect on the photo or whether it was made of some alloy. I looked at Miyu in surprise. Did you find the weapon of crime? Images taken from freepic.com, pixabay.com, canva.com. He shook his head grimly. No luck. I checked the list of items taken from the scene. There's no axe. And I called the guys, asked them in between. Nobody saw him. He finished in a whisper. I felt uneasy. I thought someone had decided to play a stupid joke. But how then? Mika shook his head again. I don't know. What about the detainee? He doesn't remember anything. Not at all. He says he fell asleep yesterday and woke up at our place. He lived with his wife and never had any grief. Neighbors speak well of him. Positive family, no quarrels, no fights. Nothing in his blood, the psychiatrist declared him sane. He's screaming that we're trying to pin a murder on him. I chuckled, the usual song. He's a fool, I said. He's got so much blood on him, he'll never get away with it. He's all right, but the axe, do you want to go down there again? Honestly, I didn't want to. That house scared me on some subconscious level, but I couldn't leave the mystery unanswered. Let's go, I said, and soon we were entering the creepy house again. Breaking the seal, I opened the door. The familiar smell hit my nose again, and for a moment, I thought I heard that voice from the dream. Kill, it whispered against my ear, and a chill ran through my body. Are you okay? Micah asked, and I nodded and moved on. I turned on the light in the murder room and stopped on the threshold. The body had already been taken away, and it was obvious from the mess that a lot of people had been there, but that wasn't what caught my attention. The axe mark on the floor was as clean as it had been yesterday. Micah squeezed past me and squatted down beside it, examining it closer. It's weird, he muttered. It's like I feel like I can reach out and grab it. And he did reach out. An unaccountable fear made me rush toward him and shout, Don't. He looked at me in bewilderment and I, already feeling like an idiot, said, Let's take a picture. Mika perked up, took out his phone, and turned on the camera. But as soon as he got it on the trail, he dropped the phone. Shit, he exclaimed and backed away. That's not how it works. What? What is it? I couldn't take it anymore. So I picked up the phone and looked at it myself. Through the lens on the screen at the sight of the footprint was a real axe. My fingers stabbed cold, and at the same time, I felt an irresistible urge to take the axe in my hands. Kill, the voice whispered again and infernal laughter followed. Driving the camera, I reached out and fumbled for the handle. As soon as I touched it, the axe seemed to materialize in our world. I felt the gnarled shaft beneath my fingers, the weighty weight of the axe. Only now the blade didn't shine, but looked old, covered with a layer of caked blood. I turned back to Micah, my head blurred and everything around me turned red. Kill, 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 screamed a voice in my head. The axe locked in my hands as if it was hungry for action and I felt myself merging with it, craving blood, hot, scarlet. Lek, what are you doing? Lek, May's voice came from far away. I felt my mouth distorting into a smile and I moved toward my partner. My temples were pounding, red blotches spreading around, leaving only mica in my field of vision. 
kill, the voice was already shrieking, and I jumped. The darkness came suddenly, and in the next instant, I opened my eyes and saw Miyu above me. My partner was looking at me worriedly, keeping a little distance from me. My head hurt like hell. I looked back. We were still in the same room. There was blood on my hands. I looked fearfully at Micah. His sleeve was soaked with blood too, and his arm was bandaged just above the elbow. Images taken from freepic.com, pixabay.com, canva.com? What? What was that? I asked. You threw yourself at me with that thing, replied Micah. Don't you remember? The images in my head were blurring. The memories were jumbled together, and it seemed impossible to make anything out. I shook my head. I dodged, but you caught my arm. And then I hit you over the head with this. He pointed to a chunk of wood that had somehow ended up in the house. Why didn't you call us? I asked, realizing with horror what I had done. You're my friend, and there's something devilish going on here. You looked like a detained Petrov, Micah continued. The axe had disappeared again. I got up and took out my phone. No use. I was looking. My partner shrugged his shoulders. Let's get out of here. This place is creepy. But what was that? I couldn't help myself. What difference does it make? We're not ghost hunters. Let's forget about it and not tell anyone, or they'll put us in a mental institution. Meh, I said. The partner turned around. Thank you. He waved his hand and went out. I hurried after him, afraid to stay in the cursed house. What about Petrov? Was it not his fault? Minka frowned. So he's not guilty. What can we do? I didn't say a word. We went home, having agreed never to bring up the case. In the morning, it became...